thank you everyone for joining us for Fashion Supply Chain's uh, What's Next. So I'm really, really grateful to all of you for giving up an hour of your time um, for this conversation that's just really important right now for Fashion Revolution Week and for every week to talk about how issues are affecting workers across the supply chain within fashion. So I've now locked the meet meeting and put everyone on mute, but what we're going to do is any questions that you have throughout the chat, you can just pop them down in the chat box, which I think is in the right hand corner. Um, we will have some questions at the end. Um, so anything that you want to ask any of the panelists or myself, just pop it there. Um, the meeting's being recorded as well, and it's also being live streamed on Facebook. So if any of your friends weren't able to get on or anything like that, um, you can point them that way. Um, so today's panel discussion is part of Fashion Revolution Week 2020. This is a week where fashion revolutionaries around the world come together to ask the questions that are important to the fashion industry right now, which are who made my clothes and also this year, what's in my clothes. And it all started in 2013 after the Rana Plaza disaster. Um, so it's been going a long time now and it's completely global with teams in over 70 countries. So we're coming to you today from Scotland um, I'm part of the Fashion Revolution Scotland team. Um, and we've got sort of a huge programme of events throughout the week from panels like this to different talks and workshops. So make sure to check out the timetable we've got going and basically just get involved. Um, this week's all about using your voice. So um, if you have any kind of platform online, any social media account, you can make a difference by using that voice. So really encourage you all to take a look at the sort of resources that Fashion Revolution have to get involved after that. So as I said, the theme today is all about supply chains. So we're going to explore how coronavirus has been impacting the fashion supply chain. Um, we're also going to be talking about the ways that business models are sort of shifting and the impact this is having on workers across the supply chain and around the world. And we're gonna try and end with a sort of focus on positive actions, because I know this topic can be a little bit heavy um, because we all want to help out. So we're gonna discuss ways that we can all help to needed changes, because obviously when we emerge from this crisis, we all want a better fashion industry. So that's how we're gonna try and structure it. And just before I introduce all of my panelists today, I just wanna say a huge, huge thank you to the Glasgow School of Art. The GSA Sustainability Department um, have been sponsoring this event and they've also just been supporting the work that Fashion Revolution Scotland does. So we're really grateful for them and for championing sustainable fashion and textiles throughout Scotland. So thank you, GSA. Okay, so, First off, my name is Ruth McGilp. I'll be chairing the panel today. Um, I'll talk a bit now, but then I'll shut up for a bit, so don't worry. <laughs> I am part, as I said, I'm part of the Fashion Revolution Scotland team. I've been volunteering with them for a few years now, um, and I'm sort of hosting a few events and things like that. But usually when we're not in lockdown, we do a lot of different events throughout the community, be it a film screening or a clothes swap or a panel discussion. Um, and we also do some campaigning and sort of political action as well. Um, aside from that, I'm an ethical fashion blogger, so I write about ethical fashion um, and the sort of intersection of fashion and sustainability. Um, I've been doing that for several years and then my sort of day job is that I'm a freelance digital marketer and I do that with ethical brands. So that's me. Um, I'll now introduce my panellists. So first up on the panel, we have Simon Cotton. Simon is the chief executive of Johnson's of Elgin. So Johnson's of Elgin are the largest employer in UK textile manufacturing, and they're 203 years old, which is so mind blowing and impressive. Um, they supply some of the world's leading luxury brands, and they also make their own collection that's shown at London Fashion Week. Um, it's one of two, only two vertical mills in the UK. Um, which means they can completely control everything that goes into every single garment. Um, Simon also sits on the board of the Sustainable Fibre Alliance, the UK Fashion and Textile Association, and the Scottish Textile Industry Leadership Group. And he's a visiting lecturer at Robert Gordon University. So he's a very busy guy and we're really looking forward to hearing from him. Next up, we have Dr. Sue Thomas. Sue is an assistant professor of fashion at Harriet Watt University. She's also the ethics officer for the School of Textiles and Design there. 
and she leads the brilliant fashion ethics course, the Masters. Um, back in 2016, she gave a brilliant TED talk called Ethics of the New Black. And in 2017, she published a book called Fashion Ethics. Now this book is incredible. I've read it myself. It's a sort of complete overview of all the ethical issues in the fashion industry, all the way from design to manufacturing to retail. And she goes kind of beyond the sort of more simplistic issues, like right into kind of the more endemic issues of the fashion industry, like sizeism and ageism and diversity and animal rights, sort of everything you can think of when it comes to ethics. So we're looking forward to hearing from Sue as well. Next up, we have Natasha Staden. Go with. Natasha is an ethical compliance specialist. So Natasha's aim is to enable businesses to adopt sustainable and ethical practices. And she has a real emphasis on workers' rights. She's worked across every part of the fashion supply chain, from small scale ethical production to sort of global fast fashion brands. So, and also Natasha is the founder of The Other Choice, which is a brilliant online platform that encourages uh, sort of conscious consumerism. Um, she's also hosting another event for Fashion Revolution tonight at 7.30. Um, plug, plug, plug. Yeah, I got to <laughs> <laughs> um, that event is going to be really interesting. It's called A Practical Guide to Ethical Trade. So really sharing her expertise on um, how the supply chain can be more ethical. So if you are interested in an evening of more ethical fashion conversation, then make sure to join that as well. And then finally, last but not least, we have Mary Beth Graham. Um, she is the Events and Policy Advisor at the Scottish Women's Convention. Uh, the Scottish Women's Convention consults with women throughout Scotland, giving them a platform for their voices to be heard, all in a sort of safe and welcoming environment. And this is about utilising women's lived experiences to influence policy decisions. Um, so that's public policy nationally and internationally. And she also volunteers alongside me at Fashion Revolution. Um, she's hosting some really interesting blog posts about uh, human rights in the fashion industry which are gonna be published on my website, ruthmcgilt.com throughout the week and beyond. So make sure to keep an eye out on those as well. So all the words are over now from me. Um, again, like I said, if you've got any questions throughout this panel discussion, pop them down in the chat and I will make sure to read them out at the end. So I'm gonna kick off with the questions if that's okay. So first off, I have a question for Simon. Um, so Johnson's of Elgin, as you say, it's a sort of fully vertical mill. Can you maybe explain a little bit about what a vertical supply chain means? And also maybe comment a little on how coronavirus has, has impacted that for you, impacted your own supply chains? Yeah, it's kind of an old model. Um, so basically the, the concept is that you put the raw fiber in at one stage and then you take it through every single stage of production within the same site. So we dye our fiber, we, we make our yarn, we weave, we knit, we finish the cloth, we sew, we do everything that we can on site. And that's the way textiles used to be done. Nowadays, typically, you're talking about a global supply chain where um, you, you have limited visibility over what happens. Within our situation, we're lucky. We can control everything that comes into our production. We can control all the chemicals, for example. So we signed up to the Zero Discharge of Hazardous Chemicals uh, initiative a few years ago. So we have very stringent control on what comes in. We have very stringent control on what goes out in terms of effluent, and we're a living wage employer. So uh, obviously, we, we know that there are fair and reasonable uh, salaries being paid within all the production processes. The only bit we don't control is the raw fiber production. So we don't have our own sheep. We don't have our own goats. Um, and there's, there's issues still to, to deal with there. And that's why we set up the Sustainable Fibre Alliance to try and address those, because we felt that had to be um, addressed as a collective of companies rather than something we could take on ourselves. Great, and, and how has um, coronavirus impacted your own supply chains? Well, we're, we're, we're pretty much closed up. Um, in fact, we are closed up. We've closed down production now for, for several weeks, so nothing is uh, being made at the moment. Um, obviously, at some point it will restart, but we're some way away from that at the moment in Scotland. Um, and that's one of the choices, you know, obviously, because we're based in the UK and because of government support for these things, it's a choice that we can make. If we were located somewhere else, we wouldn't have that, that option. 
Um, when we come to what's going on out in Mongolia, for example, or China, where the cashmere is being produced in particular, there are serious issues there because people can't get out to where the herders are to, to buy fiber. The deherring plants are in a lot of cases closed. So the ability of the herders to sell their fiber, which represents 80% of their income, um, is just very, very poor at the moment. So there, there are some big issues right where the fiber comes from. Right, interesting. And I mean, does anyone else want to kind of comment on that idea of, I don't know what your guys' experience is of um, kind of local production and maybe this sort of idea of localized production and vertical supply chains could be something that is um, easier to comply with ethical standards. I don't know if you have any views on that, Natasha, um, from a sort of ethical standards point of view. Um, I think when you, uh, wherever production is, I mean, even you saying, Simon, that, you know, you're fully vertical, but just that one step before, um, yeah. you know, the fibre um, is not quite there and you actually need to put an alliance together to deal with that. So it just goes to show that every single part of the supply chain has so many issues and certainly, you know, globally, supply chains are absolutely riddled with issues, right from workers' belief of what their, their rights are to, you know, the cotton that's been grown in the farm, you know, grown and their rights as well. So, um, I mean, I'm all for local production, but the UK is absolutely not without its issues. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I think, I think it's fair to say as well that, that these issues are so complicated, and Sue talked about it in her work as well, there's so many different dimensions um, that trying to manage those when you've got multiple components. And today, if we're honest, you know, buyers very often don't get to visit their plants. Designers certainly don't get to visit their plants. So it, it is very opaque what goes on in the supply chain. Um, we're, we're lucky from that point of view, but I appreciate Scottish production is not an answer for the high street. You know, it is, it is an expensive thing to do. It works on a luxury level, but it's not the answer for everything. So you do have to you know, brands and retailers do have to spend that time really delving into their supply chain so they understand what's going on. And Simon, do you feel that coronavirus is some sort of um, exposing some of the problems that maybe larger brands or high street brands have in their supply chains? I, I think it's become another issue, hasn't it? Because um, there's that whole issue of, of responsibility. You know, when your supply chain's right around the world and you never actually see it, it's very easy to, to turn a blind eye to, to your responsibilities there. You know, we've always worked in the communities that, you know, that our owners live in. You know, we, we have the river goes past the house of, that, that feeds the mill goes past the house of the people who work in the plant. So we've got clear responsibility there. When, when you're on the other side of the world, it's proving to be very easy to wash your hands of responsibilities. Absolutely. So I'm going to move on to Sue now, because um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about how you feel that coronavirus is impacting the workers in the supply chain and sort of in the international fashion system. And do you think this crisis is putting more emphasis on those workers? It's going to force some changes for them that are perhaps needed? Um, I think yes, yes and yes, as they'd say. But um, I think what we're forgetting is the fact that um, we are, and I'm going to use inverted commas, we're safe here, relatively. Um, but in reality, when I say safe, it means that there will be something afterwards. Whereas I think we forget, and not everybody, but most people forget that uh, there isn't insurance, there isn't furlough systems where these garments are being made. And it's out there if you look, um, but um, there's quite a lot of um, uh, information coming back from the supply chain, both manufacturers and also uh, Ministry of Textiles, for instance, in India. The minister um, filmed a video basically saying, don't abandon us. We're working in this together. Don't abandon us. And you've seen that if you're following the sort of discourse in anything, you know, any of the industry publications or even in LinkedIn. Um, there are publications now which are coming up with figures about when the orders are placed, um, the garments have been made and the companies are trying to pull out from paying the manufacturers. And that means that um, 
the, if the manufacturers aren't play, paid, they have to lay off or sack their workers. And again, they can't go around and uh, maybe get universal credit or something like that. Um, in India, in some of the places which where people are working on contract, the workers are walking home, walking home across India. And um, some, you know, basically, you know, sort of anecdotally, people are saying when they get reach their village, they're being driven away because they may have coronavirus, which, you know, um, so we're sitting here thinking, oh, no, not another queuing at Tesco's dam. Um, this is happening. And people are probably often more aware of the food supply chain because they can't get it because they need to eat it. Whereas, you know, we could just wash something and wear it another day. Um, you need to eat. So I think it's secondary to what's happening, but um, it is quite much more problematic. I don't like using words like disastrous, but, you know, disastrous for other people. And I, I was re-watching True Cross Just, and True Cross, sorry, and um, rem there was a point, I think, that uh, Lucy Siegel made about basically the cost is borne by the most vulnerable of our of our industry as it normally stands. I think there are alternatives. It's not the gloom and doom, but as it stands, it's kind of not working. I, I saw a stat from the Center for Workers' Rights that um, over a million garment workers in Bangladesh alone have been fired or suspended from work. Yeah. And 80.4% 80, 80 of these were sent home without furlough or severance. Exactly. And there's quite a lot of reporting going on through the Clean Clothes Campaign, which is a union labour organisation. So if anybody's thinking, good grief, or worth that effect, I better find out. Um, it's worth having a look at that to get the updates, because your favourite um, well-known labels are listed to see what the options they're taking, whether they've paid off, whether it's partially paid off. Um, again, there's quite a lot of debate and calling out um, on the internet of companies like, you know, fill in your favourite label, cheap label, um, and it says, you know, come on so and so pay us, you know, and that I mean, basically, they're having to fall back on that because that's the only way, well, not the only way, but the main way that they can get people to pay, take notice. And I, I would say that it does work. I think people often feel now they're in lockdown that they maybe can't make as much of a difference. You know, we can't get out on the streets and, and protest this, but um, you might, I don't know if you're alluding to that pay up campaign that's going on. Yeah. Um, There's I, elements of that, yeah. yeah. I think I think it's um, important. I, I mean, follow on on your idea about there's nothing, there isn't anything we can do. I think even in the short term, you know, it sounds ridiculous. We can remember, and I think a lot of companies are back footing um, on this, in as much as they're on the back foot rather than the front front. Um, <coughs> they don't realise that um, the customer won't forget. The customer doesn't forget. And particularly if you're looking at certain areas, you know, loyal, brand loyal, millennials, um, this is going to go on their, you know, not so nice book list. So, you know, if you haven't paid your workers, we've heard about it, you know, you just go to a somewhere else. Absolutely. I feel that in some cases it's, this crisis has really highlighted sort of the true colours of some brands. And oh yeah, yeah, totally. Feel not hopeful, but slightly, I feel that people are maybe seeing um, what's been going on all along, but it's mm -hmm. just more in the forefront now. It's a, a major opportunity for change and rethink. And that's, you know, in between the, oh my gosh, I'm queuing at Tesco's. Um, the, this is what you can actually think on and, and what and how this could change. And, you know, before it really got scary, uh, I postgrad students on the ethics in fashion course. And I sort of, you know, like uh, put ideas together on how it might work and where the benefits were, you know. So it isn't all doom and gloom for us at this point, thinking about it from a distance. It may be for um, a mum trying to support her kids in Bangladesh. Absolutely. So on that on that topic of, of the workers themselves, um, I wanted to talk to Mary Beth a little bit about women in particular, um, as you do so much amazing work with the Scottish Women's Con uh, Convention. Um, and we often hear this stat that more than 80% of garment workers are women, and women aged between 18 and 35, as well as very young women. Um, what, is, what are the impacts on these women right now within the fashion industry? And is the fashion industry doing anything to protect these vulnerable women around the world from both the health impacts and the economic impacts of coronavirus? Is there anything that you found? Well, I think the, I think the first thing to start with is that this, um, this 
pandemic is affecting women in a particular way um, that is different to how it's affecting and it's affecting vulnerable women in a different way and I'm seeing that in the sort of day-to-day -day work um, just looking at uh, what's happening here in Scotland um, and what's happening in the UK um, but then when we look further what we have um, within the industry is um, a reliance on the lack of workers' rights and that leads into a lack of um, the realisation of women's rights in a lot of countries um, mm -hmm. where uh, there possibly is a potential for a progression and development in that field mm -hmm. um, but for as long as we have a huge transnationals that um, find the opportunity to exploit that, um, that progression is going to be hindered in their domestic policies. Um, so in terms of what the industry is doing in itself, um, as Sue said, the Clean Clothes campaign, I've got loads of coverage and it's a, um, it's a really complex issue in that every country has um, its own parts of the supply chain. Every country has its own ways in which the factories work. Um, so that relies then on brands uh, being able to see each stage of the supply chain and as we've all touched on that's just not really the case across the board um but i think one of the most worrying things is in the very much short term um the people in our communities here that we are seeing additional support for um, and that we are seeing recognized as vulnerable people um, so uh, children, uh, women who, um, the, the increase of domestic abuse we're seeing, um, the, uh, the pregnant women being recognised as vulnerable, um, all of these groups are people that work within the supply chains and so as much as we are um, within the UK we're seeing sort of um, new policies coming into play and new pots of funding. Um, there's, in developing countries, there's not those pots sitting there. They don't have, like what has been said, they, we don't have that insurance to fall back on. Um, and we've developed an industry that um, at the bottom feeds off the most vulnerable and it's people mm. that are living hand to mouth. So mm. taking two weeks off for your quarantine, even if your employer is able to provide you with the right working conditions, um, taking the two weeks off if you were supposed to can mean real, very, very serious consequences to women and their families. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's, it's really concerning when we start to think of the fact that um, not only is this affecting Swayze, but like, like you said, um, so almost 4 million people are working in uh, Bangladesh within their uh, ex within their fashion exporting industry and such a huge majority of those people are in some way suffering through the income and we are basically seeing our global fashion industry rely on them taking the hit of mm -hmm. and the loss of profits and it's yep. yeah it's a real concern and we need to call for more. I think that's so poignant how you said this industry relies on people like the garment workers in Bangladesh taking the brunt of it it's like mm -hmm. it doesn't it's not just an unintended consequence the whole system relies on that fact I think that's yeah well they were disadvantaged for the most part beforehand you know as I said the suit I've got the quote here because I'm an academic I write these things down um, basically Lucy Siegel said the risk is carried by the most vulnerable it was the case before this started and this is just going to amplify it I, I don't see a happy ending in the, that sense unless well, we are going to have to move very fast to write it when we have the opportunity absolutely so I want to talk a bit about what brands maybe are doing to ensure um, worker safety and, and worker rights and, and things along those lines. So Natasha, I had a question for you. Um, have you found that like amidst this coronavirus crisis, are fashion brands keeping up with their ethical <laughs> standards? And when we do emerge from this crisis eventually, like how important are those standards and, and legislation going to be? As you said, we're gonna have to move quickly um, 
how are these rules going to be put into place and how are these safety nets going to be put into place? Hmm. Well, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, I mean, there's a real mixed bag that you can see, you know, coming through social media as well. Mm. And um, we never really know the truth behind, um, you know, what's being said, like any, any relationship out there. Um, but brands that have ethical values aligned in their core have absolutely, will absolutely attempt to uphold their standards. And, uh, but that being said, the, um, the lockdown variations and laws in different countries, um, ethical compliance programs will not be a physical thing at the moment. There'll be desk-based assessments or mm. um, supplier conversation. That, and that's obviously only with factories that may still be open, which, you know, I'm not sure how many are open still. Um, now, the Workers' uh, Rights Consortium have done a list, and I'm sure many of you will have seen it on social uh, media, and it's basically giving a naughty and nice list. Um, mm. And I did contact them to, you know, just see what the stipulation was there to, to be on the nice list, and that really was um, anything from cut uh, products that have been cut to shipments um, that were being paid for without discount, so they weren't asking for, say, 30% discount or anything. Any brands that were honouring that were being put on that list. Um, what I fear the most is that there's already an unbalanced power between supplier and factory and brands. Yep. And so if we're, um, if I think that the, it's probably going to drive standards even lower and that um, even if brands do pay, mm. will that money get to the workers? Yep. Um, and I guess the second part is that I think... Um, it's absolutely imperative that the UK government step up on their modern slavery statement, um, slavery act requirements. Um, as you rightly said, so a lot of these issues were here before Corona and, you know, without financial penalties, a lot of business are not going to take it seriously. They just don't care. And I really do believe um, a lot of people don't care. You know, you have, you have two sides of society um, and we don't have to go outside the UK to see this. I mean, in the, ethic, in the uh, Environmental Audit Committee last year, mm -hmm. MP Mary Craig did an amazing job of yeah. highlighting a lot of the issues and the open secret that mass underpayment of minimum wage in Leicester and outer areas of Manchester and the poor working conditions. And they asked in that forum, how is this happening? Mm -hmm. Well, lip service modern slavery statements for a start. And... The people that are trying to help, so auditors like me, they also said in this, um, in the committee, they reported that auditors are getting um, abused, beaten up. Um, and I certainly know of colleagues that have been fired when they've brought serious non-compliances towards board, the boards. Yes. So now... <laughs> In my mind, like we're all built neurologically different. You know, we were all, we've all grown up with different um, behavioral issues. Um, and I've met some absolutely gorgeous people in the fashion industry. A lot of them are best mates. Um, but I've also met a lot of bullies and narcissists. And that is where government intervention needs to come in because margins will always win for them over morals every single time. Um, I really think that we need the fashion industry, um, like many unregulated industries, to be um, regulated like the food industry here. Now, some of their, um, some of their uh, key attributes are protecting the consumer, protecting the manufacturer, and protecting fair competition. Now, you know, they've gone on a long process. You know, quite a few years ago, they had many of the same problems as the fashion industry, as well as many other car washes, nail factories, um, building sites. You know, it's, it's not just fashion, but we are focusing on fashion today. So the BBC also, um, they reported at the end of February that a lot of buyers are now looking at the UK because of coronavirus. Mm -hmm. But what are the government going to do to ensure the migrants and the workers in the fashion industry are okay? Are we going to have to have a Rana Plaza in Leicester or a saris and you know a strikers in saris before they're going to act? Wow, that is um. Rant, so. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I almost don't. I think this idea that um with coronavirus these sort of ethical standards slipping is, is a real fear 
And I, I wanted to flag um, an article that I read the other day by Claire Press in the Business of Fashion, where she's talking about this exact issue of maybe brands now seeing um, a sort of opportunity to um, to slack on their commitments to sustainability and to ethics. And this idea that, well, I'll just quote her directly because she says it better than I could, but even in times of crisis, responsible fashion is no optional extra. The long-term costs of failing to prioritize sustainability are too great, which I really think it kind of got me because I think for me, there's a real fear um, that this legislation, and, and like you said, the UK it's, needs to step up too. And it's not just about thinking, oh, it's all on the other side of the world. You know, this stuff is happening on our doorstep. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, it just, I mean, even the environmental committee last year, what came out of that when it was taken forward? You know, it was a really cool outcome from the government. Well, they rejected it, didn't they? I mean, they did, after yeah. all that work, they just went, no, and that was it. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Exactly. So that's, I mean, you know, there, there does need to be change in government in the UK, for sure. Absolutely. And there is actually a petition to get that Fixing Fashion report back on the agenda. So I'll maybe share the link to that if anyone wants to Oh, yes, please. I'm up for uh, signing yeah. up. Yep, yep. Everybody I'll, I'll, here. Yeah. yeah, everybody here should sign. And also, <laughs> also the, um, the pay up petition, I'll put that link in the event as well. Um, um, so moving on to maybe this sort of idea of what action can we actually take um, just a question to all of you whoever wants to jump in um, how can we as an industry move forward after coronavirus so what do you think are the steps that need to be put in place to protect people and to protect the planet when we emerge from this hmm. can I just really quickly go Sorry, I'm going I'm okay. just going to go back one point and say um, when we're talking of the sh sort of short term decisions that are being made just now, um, I think one of the things that brands need to be, well, that we all collectively need to be wary of um, is the, uh, the slack that comes with declaring a state of emergency in terms of um, like your legal obligation to oh. upholding human rights. Um, and I think this is something that there's a lot of, con there's a lot of concern about in um, some developing countries where there's um, quite a lot of loud union activism, which is two things that don't typically, aren't typically able to go hand in hand. Um, and we've seen it here with the, um, with the UK's legislation that they've put in place to, um, we need you do need to enable some adjustments and we need to um sort of reprioritize in times like this there's no denying that that's what and people are doing it in um, a really sort of time pressured uh, situation but what we need to be observant of as an industry and as people here who care about the consequences of this um, on others is wow. um watching how the a uh, the legal frameworks change and how the short term regulations that come into place um, will potentially exploit that um, the, like the legal capacity for your state of emergency. Mm. Wow. But that's just a wee side note, sorry. No, I mean, it's really interesting. It's a scary one, but a good one. <laughs> and I think it's interesting to think about like the short term and the, and the long term. So thank you for adding that. Mm. Sorry, Simon. Sorry, I was just going to say, in terms of what we can do, I mean, for the first time, we've got a really clear uh, list of which brands are behaving responsible in relation to coronavirus and which ones aren't. Now, that's not everything that goes on in supply chain, but it's a really good shorthand to where those brands' values are. And, and the power lies entirely with the consumer. It's going to be very difficult for governments to legislate on things that don't happen within the jurisdiction. It's mm. going to be very difficult for brands to take bad economic choices for themselves if the consumers don't back them on it. So, I mean, you've got brands there who are being absolutely responsible, who are doing the right thing. I've got customers of mine who are phoning us up and saying, we recognize that you're probably going to have a cash flow issue. What can we do to help? Um, now, that's not happening everywhere, but where people, where brands and retailers are doing it, we need to get behind them. Mm. 
I think so. I mean, I, I think a lot of it often is about choose your hero brands. And um, I'm, I tend to watch to see what, how Patagonia are going to jump. And they jumped very early. They closed their shops and put folk on, um, and I think their factories too. Um, uh, they put people on uh, full pay, as far as I understood. And I think I've read, because it's happening in the United States, so all things are different. Um, but I understood that they were doing, um, reopening their Reno factory in Nevada, which I think is the, the, the mending factory. And they were observing um, social distancing. So the staff were there, but they weren't close together. So um, I don't know, the other people have hero brands, but it's about um, looking you know, to see who's doing the good things. Like yourself, Simon, I was watching how you were going to go and it, it was, um, you're quite quick, which I think is good. I think sort of vacillating is problematic, you know, in terms of how to go forward and how to close down and what to carry on doing. And I think, um, I believe that people will have a memory. I mean, maybe I'm a, uh, what's the word, sort of, uh, sort of um, over sort of Pollyanna, you know, are hopeful about everything. But I think people are going to remember not so much shame and blame, but, you know, making a choice within the market. If you can go with a company, you know, aren't, you know, saying, oh, we don't want to buy that or give us a discount, which I think is extremely, well, it sounds ridiculous, but rude. How can you go to a, you know, a company which employs people on ridiculous wages and then tell the owner to take you know give you know a huge company not named a discount yeah i mean it's it's business i suppose but i just find it unbelievable anyway that's probably why i'm an academic not running a company hmm. <laughs> so um i had a couple of questions via email which i'm going to ask first before i move on to the ones in the chat which i'm having a look at and there are some amazing questions so i thanks. know some corkers hello to um is it anna in in uh, cambodia wow yeah, definitely <laughs> she's living there still cool so um i just wanted to ask these ones via email because i thought they were quite interesting um, and anyone is welcome to answer these. Um, so this one came in from John Oates, who I think is on the chat here. Yep. Um, so he says, we talk a lot about end to end fashion, but do we fully understand what happens in the supply base? So I'm not sure if maybe Natasha, you want to comment or? Um, well, I mean, I think that that is a, once again, a real mixed bag, um, like the Simon Cottons of this world um will you know know greatly where their supply chain is um and even the best um you know even a lot of the brands with a really robust ethical compliance program may know their you know first tier maybe their second but really don't know what's going down underneath uh, under that you know where are your buttons made where's the dying where's the um where have the chemicals come from um where has the the fabrics come from so um i think that would be a mixed bag um the um and the fashion revolution um transparency index was released today that's right. and that sort of yeah. touches on this yeah. idea that a lot of um a lot of brands don't even know what's happening in their own supply chains um so if, if anyone's curious about the actual you know it, it literally names and blames the brands for this it's quite interesting because like you say it is a mixed bag some brands are doing amazing work and others really they only know the tip of the iceberg so um that's a really interesting read the new the new report got released today and even uh, then some people some brands can be a victim of circumstance as well you know they think it's in there they're doing all the right things they have a pro compliance program and then one factory is subcontracted out to another mm. um, you know, it's incredibly difficult. Absolutely. Um, so there's one more question via email and then I promise I'll move on to everyone's questions. Um, this one's quite interesting, um, particularly in um, the conversations people are having in the fashion industry about after the lockdown lifts and shops reopen, what do we do with all, of, all the stock? You know? Yes, that this is, that so is this, worrying. Mm. Yeah, so this question is sort of on that issue. Um, Lindsay Carlson says, do you think the, ish the industry will address the issue of overconsumption and can a brand call itself ethical if they promote discounting that encourages customers to buy because it's cheaper and not necessarily because they need it? Well, somebody said to me, um, will people want to buy something which is the wrong season? 
and an old design, you know. And so traditionally, uh, prob well, I was thinking what were the options? Well, traditionally, back in the oldie bad days and probably some current days, people would burn it. Um, but the thing being is, you know, that <laughs> goes against everything we're all talking about. So uh, back down to, do they discount it? Do they not order anything now for another year? I mean, I don't know whether, you know, what the options are. I mean, you know what, you shouldn't buy anything you don't absolutely love anyway. Oh, yes. So it shouldn't really matter on the season. If you love it, save for it. <laughs> I, I think it's hard to ask the, the industry to sell less. You know, at the end of the day, we've got to buy less. That, that's the key. It's mm -hmm. going to be really hard, but it's hard. It's the most difficult. Whenever I'm around industry people and we're talking about all the sustainability issues, there's a lot of goodwill, there's a lot of good feeling. But when it comes to how do you get consumers to buy less, that's, that's not something the industry is going to solve. That's something consumers are going to have to solve. Interesting. Well, I'm going to move on to the questions now because there are so many and they are so interesting so I'm gonna right kick off. well done folks <laughs> um, oh firstly a couple people have asked about where my stat came from about um people leaving um garment workers without severance pay um that came from the center for global workers rights so that's <laughs> my um and i wanted to ask this question from uh where has it gone here we go from amanda who says I live in Cambodia and most garment factories are closed. Many cancelled orders, even though they were already made. Um, the government is meant to give them a third of their normal pay while factories are closed. I'm concerned that if we start thinking about pulling back production to the West, what will happen to the workers in Cambodia? I don't think pulling back production to the West is the answer. You know, we've got to be... That there, there's no comparison between labor costs in Western Europe and labor costs in, in Cambodia or China or Bangladesh. So the, the supply chains that we have are the ones that we're going to live with, but we have to do them better. And it's not, it's not about paying 50 pounds rather than five pounds. The last 10% is the bit where the irresponsibility comes in. Mm -hmm. you know, so this is not saying everybody's got to buy really, really expensive luxury products. That, that's not the case. Everybody's got to pay a little bit more and you buy a little bit less. I think as well, further on that, there's a just to kind of bridge that with the question below, um, when someone's asking us to play devil's advocate and um, what are big retailers thinking when they break these contracts, um, to play devil's advocate and as many of us saw, like you see in the true cost, there is constant arguments coming from the industry that there is provision of jobs. Um, those jobs provide a uh, food and housing and a uh, capacity for education, a uh, capacity for development across the country. Um, but I think where the difference is, um, like Simon's saying, it's that um, additional push that breaks between um, enabling a country to develop and us working in a, in a positive trade um, sort of set up uh, within the supply chain. Um, when we take that step one step further for increased profits um, and it costs um, the human rights uh, to be like realised or recognised in any capacity. So um, no one, I, I think when we have these discussions, um, we want to herald companies that do produce um, home at home and produce locally. And But we also want to say that we we want this to work and we want this to work on a global scale but it needs reform because right now this is is incredibly destructive in the format that we've got at the moment so this other question kind of um follows on from that how do companies get away with cancelling these orders and how are there not contracts in place um that stop this from happening or is it that no one was prepared for this type of crisis and we're just operating on business as usual. I, mean, I don't know, maybe Simon might know or, or my other colleagues on the panel, but I gather they're using, is it the force majeure? Um, as in, you know, kind of act of God kind of thing. We're in this terrible circumstance. I mean, the reality is the contracts, I feel, are quite likely to be written in the favour of the, of the um, buyers rather than the manufacturers. So there is probably a rather a lot of small print on the bottom. I would they say, again, 
they, they rely on the force majeure. The contracts are lit, written in their own country. So for a, a Bangladeshi company to come to the UK to, to sue a retailer is an expensive thing. It's a long-winded thing. And meanwhile, the cash is in their bank, you know? So the economic might, you know, there is no comparison, even though some of these factories uh, in developing countries are, are quite big, they do not have anything like the power of our big retail and, and high street brands. Yeah, and, and also a lot of these, you know, factories, some of them, you know, they, they might not be that big as well. So they've only got that one supplier. So they just kind of need to, you know, accept it because otherwise they're not going to get other orders from them. You know, most of these things will never get to court and, and because it, the, the company will have disappeared or they just won't fund the, the legal costs. If they do get to court two, three years down the road, maybe they, they, they get their money back, but it's probably too late then. I mean, it is quite a regular occurrence as well that, you know, fabrics are cut and then um, brands will, you know, so, so they've ordered a thousand pieces and it all gets cut and then they say, no, we only want a hundred because actually it hasn't sold as well as we, we thought it would. And they don't reimburse yeah. for the fabric. So somebody else, uh, Sarah, has asked, um, are the EU doing anything about this? Um, so she knows they have a fund to help workers in Myanmar, but what about other producer countries? Uh, that's a good question. I'm afraid I don't know the answer. I know that, um, well, there's been a lot of politics about, you know, this has happened and what's happened to Brexit in the meantime, you know, has that fallen over as if it was working anyway. But um, so there are people, you know, they are, you know, organized because it's a, you know, a large organ, a large a group of um, countries, they're organized and they have, um, you know, other uh, I suppose committees, etc., that do that kind of thing. I don't know whether we're reaching out for it or helping or anyway, or anyway at all. I still find it well. Uh, the whole business about has the plane come from Turkey yet? I find you know with all the scrubs and stuff on, I find hugely ironic. You know, thinking well, wow, has nobody got any supply chain software for crying out loud? It's on the plane. It's not on the plane you know, come on, work it out. Um, so I think, you know, the fact that we are using, you know, someone outside to manufacture scrubs, totally appropriate, but all the, the in, well, the news, and that can be questioned, has been full of all these um, local manufacturers, etc. all sorts of folk volunteering to do various things. So we know that they're, you know, it's not that easy. It's not like making a penny for your mum. You need the right sort of material. You need the right finishes. You need the pattern that fits, all this kind of stuff. And um, not everybody can do that. So you can't take up all the offers. But it just seemed to me that, a lot of people are reporting that no one gets back to them or anything like that. So, you know, where it's coming, it's not coming. Oh, it didn't come today. We're doing. And there are companies that will be able to make um, some scrubs. It's not going to be stopping anything, but it's going to help in some way. It's like taking around a cake and a bag of sandwiches. It helps a bit. And why can't we do that? But apparently not. Hmm. It's very interesting. I, I'm not sure um, about everyone watching this, whether they're all sort of in the industry, but we've got a couple of questions from a kind of consumer perspective that a couple of you might be able to um, comment on. So first off, um, how can we make consumers care about where their clothes come from? So to support decent wages and conditions, do you, do you think customers care about that right now? I think uh, the thing that Fashion Revolution work towards in terms of um, really considering the people behind um, behind the garments and also um, the really striking thing that's come from this pandemic is the fact that it is a it's a global issue and it's so this is this hasn't been um, a natural disaster that's happened somewhere that we suddenly just encourage our government to throw aid at it's something that is affecting all of us and it's affecting everyone in like very similar but very different ways mm -hmm. um so i think i've kind of lost my train of thought a wee bit but basically um take it i think one of the important things that, that we really need to start doing is stop always considering ourselves to being as being a consumer within this conversation um, and considering ourselves as like global citizens, like we're people, the people that make our clothes are people. Um, removing the um, 
removing the entire 100% focus on what companies do we choose, who do we not choose, who do we chastise, who do we um, rally against. And in the same way that we've, I mean, Brexit's already been mentioned, so I'm just going to keep going with that. But in the same, in the same way that everyone um, has, like, there's been like a total like political activism fire lit, and people are starting to really it, p politics is, um, it's not for everyone, but um, it is there for us to. Um, to learn more about it and to learn about how we can push for change and there's people that we should be holding more responsible and we can do that whether we've got the 40 pounds to spend on something or not and whether we make that choice and to, so to I would really like for us to move um, forward in a new way as consumers but also as a new way just as people and seeing our like global like brothers and sisters as being people that we should be considering just as much as we're all now right now suddenly considering our neighbours and everyone in, in our community. Mm -hmm. I support that. I think that's a really good point, Mary Beth. I think that whole notion of, um, I, you know, like a, um, a an empathy rush or whatever that people are having they're thinking beyond themselves they're seeing the neighbor may be struggling they'll be seeing you know that this person hasn't gone out recently what's up all this kind of thing they're looking but i think if that is to say harness sounds much new to me manipulative but of realizing that's the the way that people are at the moment i think it's an opportunity to start thinking as you say about who else is involved and one of the things i'm really interested in is actually having the voice of the workers um with you know when all these um, you know great organized we're going to change everything happens that we actually hear it not from the suppliers uh, as much as you need them as well but actually from people are working on the lines who are sewing um what's their life like what are they looking for and we kind of forget they're not the same as us um they have different needs their needs are different because of the situation they're in so the humans they have the same needs but we don't you know, we don't need to um, support, you know, grandma, uncle, cousins. That might be the case for one woman worker and children, you know. Uh, so it's that sort of um, extending that neighbourly a little bit further than just our, you know, um, postal code. I think that's that's brilliant. And I really like um, Mary Beth's um, point on moving away from the word consumer and onto a global citizen. Um, I, do, I do feel that consumers are maybe a little confused right now about should they be shopping? There's a question here, is it, is it better to shop online and, and help the brands that are doing it right to keep going? Should we be not shopping? And how is, how is this pandemic changing how we shop as consumers and as, as citizens? You know, when brands are doing the right thing at the moment, um, and I'm talking about not brands like us, but people who are buying from Bangladesh, for example, they're taking six weeks of goods that are on the water that are being sea freighted, and they're taking probably another six weeks of commitment for work in progress. They're actually taking a huge financial hit, and there's not an awful lot of incentive for them on that. So they're, they're doing the right thing because they believe it's the right thing because they want to do business in the right way. So you can make up your own view whether you want to back that or not, but but I, I respect that very much um, because I appreciate it. Sometimes it's extremely hard to do something that might actually put you out of business. Yeah. I mean, that is, it's, it's really very tricky. I mean, and I think it's interesting because, um, you know, being in inside all the time, you kind of don't go out and make mad purchases. Um, if you're not on the internet quite so much in that way, you're making less purchases. I was talking to, uh, I guess I live in Tesco apparently, but when I was buying food in Tesco, the Tesco guy was, you know, saying, how are you doing? Because you see them every week. Oh, I'm okay. And he said, oh, this is great. I said, how? He says, I'm saving money. <laughs> he said, I'm not going out. Um, it's really great. I said, well, that's a good, good, you know, good outcome. But, um, you know, I think there's been some recent surveys saying that people are changing their behaviours. They feel there'll be a difference coming through. Now, whether that's about shopping, you know, I still want to look great in a glittery top, who knows, kind of thing. But um, I think people are having a time to reflect now. And I think that reflection, as we were saying earlier with Mary Beth, may go further. 
And I think, you know, that's one of the things we should be, well, optimistic and support. Absolutely. There's a great question here from Sarah, kind of following on from that point about this time that we all have to reflect a little bit. Um, she's asked, um, with the pandemic, do you think that the fashion industry um, will ever be the same again? And, and is, is there opportunity for specific changes that can be made? Maybe We're at crossroads, aren't we? We're at crossroads of whether the economics wins out or the ethics win, wins out. Um, and we've got a very, very clear choice now. It's more black and white than it's ever been. And to be honest, I don't know which way it's going to go. The economic incentives for doing the wrong thing have never been bigger. Consumer interest in doing the right thing have never been bigger. So I don't know which way it's going to go. And it's really just going to depend on the consumers. I think as well with like the World Trade Organization coming out and saying we need to be realistic about this. This is going to be like a widespread depression. Mm. Um, we are all, collect whether you are considering how you spend your disposable income or whether you're considering if your business will make it through the next two months. Um, we, we're all sitting in, <coughs> in, in, like, in different spaces where um, I think loads of the collaboration that I'm seeing that's going to be happening over the next week is going to really help um, for us to all really understand like where needs help, what what kind of business should we be supporting? Mm -hmm. um, what politicians should we be holding to account? What kind of laws are we seeing on a global scale that aren't working? Um, and so I do, th and I think as well, grinding something like fast fashion to a halt was, is just, it's actually mind blowing that this has happened. And so mm -hmm. what that's done is shown all of the spaces and it's done it's done the same thing here not in fast fashion but I, we've talked about this at the start of the talk it's sh totally shone a light on um the things that are just below the surface that are complete injustices and there that mm. were and the groups that are vulnerable in society that we are not treating at an equal level and that we are not protecting and so i think that we've got and we're all being forced to stay at home, so we're all being forced to think about something. So I think if you mm. take an interest in this, um, if you use your time just now to really consider like what changes and what can I do from my house to be helping to change this as of the get like the the first choices we start to make going forward. Absolutely, and this a few people have asked on these same sort of lines. Um, Mary here has asked. What can we actually do to take advantage? If there is an opportunity here, what can we do to take advantage um, to prevent, you know, <coughs> it just immediately returning to business as usual? Um, and I had a few points on that. As I said, I'll share some of these links, but if you're sitting at home and thinking, you know, this is unjust and I really want to help, there are things you can do. As I said, sign the pay up petition, sign the fixing fashion petition, and it's Fashion Revolution Week. This is an incredible opportunity. And we've discussed this a bit earlier, how amazing it is to have this global community here talking with us when usually it might just be the, the five of us sitting in Edinburgh. Um, it's, it's this incredible opportunity to reach new people digitally. And if you're sitting at home, you've got an internet connection, you have an opportunity and you have a voice especially in Fashion Revolution Week, where the momentum is really high, to ask brands, who made my clothes? In what conditions? Were they paid fairly? And what are you doing right now to protect them from coronavirus? I think should be one of those questions. Mm. Um, so that's my sort of point on that. I don't know if we sort of need to wrap up soon, but mm -hmm. if each of you maybe had a couple of points about, you know, maybe what you're doing or what you'd encourage others to do right now, sitting at home. Good question. I think reflection would be me. Sorry to jump in, but um, just basically thinking things through about you know what I want to do with my life in the future, how it's going forward. I think I'm not unique in that. I'm sure, but you know, working out where the priorities are and going after those rather than letting a lot of you know peripheral noise 
uh, make a difference. I mean, I, I watch social media, not, I'm not that heavily involved, but I've noticed the tone and tenor of it changing radically. And I must admit, I quite prefer this domestic studio, inverted commas, routine to, you know, people with, you know, backup dancers in a background and everybody weaving around. I just, over it, you know, it after a while you don't care about anybody's great new bikini or how great their bottom looks. It's completely irrelevant and it was to begin with, but it becomes much, much more tasteless, to be honest. You just think, oh, really, that's the best you can do, you know, to get your top off? Come on, love. Um, so that's, you know, I'm, I'm a hundred year old person, so this is what I think. But I just means that we're going, looking more you know, with a clearer eyes, I hope, at what's happening around us, you know, our representatives, um, companies, you know, and, you know, what we're doing and what our neighbours are doing, but in a, not a creepy, stalky way. Yeah. I think right at this moment, you know, brands and retailers are listening very, very carefully. They're trying to work out what happens next and, and their, their strategies are being reevaluated. So your voice as a consumer, your voice as, a, as an activist has never been stronger. There is an opportunity now to, to really make a change. And let's face it, a lot of the companies who we're seeing, we're talking about today, will, will not come through this. Um, and we've got a choice on which ones come through it. Mm -hmm. Very salient point. Mm -hmm. um, I would say to always do what you can, like make the best decision you can mm -hmm. in your situation at that time, because I think a lot of the time, um, I mean, even for me, even listening to all of you guys speak before I spoke, it actually brought a tear to my eye because you feel so disempowered as to what's going on and how horrific it is for people that you just feel like you can't do anything at all. So in whatever situation, whether it's purchasing practice or being kind to somebody or helping, you know, helping your neighbor, just, you know, just do the best you can in that situation. Um, whether it's financially or, you know, because quite often you can't, you can't choose the more expensive product. So choose the best route you can and um, definitely get involved in Fashion Revolution because um, collectively voices do make a difference. Um, Modern Slavery Act, you know, that amendment would not have happened without, um, uh, without campaigning from people. Mm -hmm. So it's really vitally important to campaign. Definitely. Absolutely. And, and it really works. I mean, just uh, I think it was yesterday, um, Primark announced a new package of support for their suppliers because of the pressure of the pay up campaign. So, you know, don't don't feel that it's it's not making a difference um, because it is. Um, so I'm really going to have to wrap up now, which is a shame because there's so many great questions. Um, but I just wanted to end with you all telling us maybe where we can find you and, and, and maybe some work that you're working on. And I just wanted to flag before I forget, I just put in the chat a link to Natasha's event this evening. So anyone that wants to continue this conversation about um, ethics in the supply chain, I really, really recommend you sign up to that. Um, but I've been Ruth McGilp. You can find me on Instagram at Ruth McGilp blog and my website is ruthmcgilp.com. But mostly this week I'm doing fashion revolution stuff. So I really hope that you can follow along with what we're up to at Fashion Revolution Scotland. Um, it's, it's only Tuesday, but we've already done um, so many great events. So I hope you can join us this week. Um, I'm, I'll finish for me anyway. I'm Sue Thomas. I teach at Harriet Watt University in Groovy Galashiels. Um, if you're looking for me, I'm on LinkedIn or sue.thomas at harrietwatt.uk, whatever. Um, um, and also my fabulous books available, uh, but get it secondhand because it's way too expensive. I don't get the money. Um, <clears throat> and the other one is check out uh, the video. It's not best and I had different hair, but uh, the TED Talk start is a starter if anyone's interested. Thank you. Uh, well, I was going to get my boobs out for, you know, my finish up. But Sue, but Sue shamed me into not. So uh, I'm Natasha, a co-founder of Top, The Other Choice. Uh, tonight I am hosting um, the Foundations of Ethical Compliance. So if you're wanting to know how to map your supply chain, what an audit report looks like, and what a supplier code of conduct looks like, I will give you all the tools and the guidance of where to go to on the web. And thanks for coming, everyone. Like, you have it at your core. Um, ethics. <laughs>
Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn as well, um, or you can go to the website johnsondevelopment.com, or hopefully in the future when we're not locked down anymore, you can come and see us because you can come into any of our mills and walk from end to end and see exactly how your product's made. And you can find my blog posts that I'll be doing um, this week and next week on Ruth's website. Um, and you can find me on Instagram at power.addressing. Um, or you can find, if you're interested in the work that we're doing in Scotland through my job, we are at SWC Women. Um, and that's across Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. Yeah, we, I've literally just published Mary Beth's amazing blog post on my site. Um, it's called Revolution from My Bed, which is excellent because, you know, Oasis. And <laughs> it just introduces these issues of um, uh, ethics in the fashion supply chain. And I really like this quote that you started with, which might be a great way to end this chat. That um, It's from Dillis Williams from the Centre for Sustainable Fashion, and it's fashion is at its best when it's working disruptively. So I think we've really got an opportunity here to disrupt the status quo in fashion. Um, we've got this incredible community of change makers and fashion revolutionaries. And I know from, from our perspective here at Fashion Revolution, it is really hopeful. Um, it's a heavy topic as I've mentioned, but um, we really have an opportunity here to make change. So I hope that you can join us in that as well. Um, so thank you so much to everyone for their questions. I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question. Um, but as I say, you can find the panelists and maybe if you have more questions, you can get in touch with them directly or feel free to post up the question on the Facebook event page um, and we'll maybe get to it at a later date. Um, and share the Facebook live with your friends and we'll maybe release a recording later on as well. Um, but yeah, thank you so much to everyone. I really appreciate it. You can turn your sound on to say goodbye if you like. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thank really you. Bye. 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 B